Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, where each week we talk about ideas for raising kids who become thriving adults. I'm your host, Audrey Monkey. I'm a summer camp director, writer, and speaker, and I've had the privilege of working with thousands of children, teenagers, young adult counselors, and parents over the past three decades. My husband, Steve, and I are raising five kids who currently range in age from 15 to 25. So my interest in raising kind, optimistic, self-reliant kids who become thriving adults is personal as well as professional. In episode 60, I'm talking with Andy Pritikin. Andy is the owner, director, and founder of Liberty Lake Day Camp in New Jersey, as well as a co-founder of Everwood Day Camp outside of Boston. Andy is passionate about the summer camp experience and has served as a leader and spokesman for the summer camp industry on national TV, in magazines, and on websites. He's also a huge proponent of free play, which is something that we talk about at length in this episode. I hope you enjoy episode 60. All right. Well, I'm excited today to have Andy Pritikin. He's a camp director from the East Coast on the podcast today. Andy, welcome. Hi, how's it going? Good. I'm a big fan of Sunshine Parenting. <laughs> great idea. I love the fact that you're helping parents. Um, you know, I think that as camp directors, I have found that uh, parents look to us like the way that they look to the, their pastors and things like that, you know, like for help with the parenting. You know, nobody gets a, an instruction book, you know, when you get kids. So Absolutely. And, yeah. and I, I think it's great. So absolutely. So I have lots of things to ask you, but before we get started, Andy, why don't you just tell a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your camp, and so that parents can know where to find you. Okay, sure. Well, I grew up, you know, in in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, I had parents that both went to camp. I I had a mom that went to camp every single summer to a little sleepaway camp for girls and used to tell me all these stories, which I had no idea what she was talking about. And then I had a dad who went to one camp for one week when he was a child for one year, one week, and he said, I am going to send my kids to camp because that was the best week of my life. And then when I was about 12 years old, my dad, who was an accountant, he got a camp director as a client. And I was fortunate to be able to go to an eight-week sleepaway camp for a couple of years up in the Berkshires, and I had the time of my life. Um, But I became became an athlete. I became a musician. I became a professional musician. So I was was focusing on that. I sort of forgot about camp. And then as a musician, I, I went and got my master's in education so I could be able to teach music while I was trying to get a record contract. And um, in doing that, what do teachers do in the summer? Well, many of them work at camp. So I reconnected with camp at that point. And my father had continued to gain clients in the camping industry and connected me to some serious, you know, successful people uh, who uh, lured me out of teaching after five years. I retired as a teacher and went full time. So that was about 24 years ago, and um, I worked for some really successful, great people, learned about day camps, sleepaway camps, and then 17 years ago, started my own camp from scratch, Um, and I've started three other camps from scratch since then, helping people um, uh, start their own, and uh, so I have this Liberty Lake, which is in a suburb of Philadelphia, and um, and I'm part owner of a camp called Everwood, which is in the suburbs of Boston, and... um, you know, I believe, you know, you run a two week camp and you know, you can accomplish a lot in two weeks. And I am of the belief that even at a day camp, you can accomplish a lot with two weeks. Once you get kids out of their own little world, out of their own little silo into a world where everybody has to collaborate with each other and work with each other, um, that, you know, that's the way, sort of the way that kids were meant to be. Um, you know, that's the way I, my summers as a, as a young child were not at camp. They were outside because my mom didn't work and my neighborhood was a camp in essence, like a Montessori camp, but it was a camp of all ages. And you learn that you don't say something stupid to the big kid. And you know, if you go over that ramp, it might be dangerous. You might get hurt and all that kind of thing. And I learned my lessons and you know, I live in a neighborhood of beautiful McMansions on a cul-de-sac and it's a ghost town. The kids are, I don't know where they are. They're in their basements on their screens, you know, mm. um, winter because you know there's snow up here in in New Jersey Um, you know it used to be that people built snowmen and threw snowballs at cars and stuff and I haven't been hit by a snowball in about two decades because (laughs) nobody's out there and um, and you know and by the way I have two kids and I'll say come on let's go outside you know it's play it's a snow day you don't have school today and they'll be like I've got 30 hours of stuff on the DVR that I need to watch you know Um, so um, I'm a big proponent of kids being outside 
of, of just playing, because I think that just play is really important. Um, and I, and myself and my colleagues in the ACA New York, New Jersey realm have been big proponents of the whole 21st century skills thing for about a decade now about that. We are not recreators. We are youth educators and we should be teaching kids all the stuff that they're not learning in school mm -hmm. and unfortunately not necessarily learning at home in a lot of homes either. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love that. The, the free play thing, I think that really rings true. I think a lot of us, I'm not even sure though, now some of the younger parents, I'm not sure what generation we're dealing with right now, but for sure when I was a kid, I was outside playing around with no adults in sight for most of my childhood. And I, I recollect I learned how to drive boats and I was in, um, I had this little boat and I, at 11 years old, I was taking my friends out on the ocean and pulling them water skiing. <laughs> <laughs> and I think now about 11 year olds, we're hiring babysitters for 11 year olds now. And, um, and what we all did, we were given so much more responsibility. So getting back to that free play thing though. Um, so what's your, like your philosophy at your camp? Um, I think you mentioned before, what types of things do kids do and how do you kind of promote the free play at your program? Um, well, just one last thing, just going on what you're talking about when we were kids. Um, I think it's uh, Lenore Skenazy that said that the cell phone we talk about how bad it is for kids, but it's actually worse for parents that has created a dependency for them to be able to know where their kids are at every moment. So where you and I used to go out, yeah, you were, you were pulling kids in rowboats on the ocean, okay? But as far as your parents knew that you were around the corner playing with your friend's house, like they didn't know where you were, right? They trusted you. Okay, but the cell phone has created this thing. Hey, call me when you get there. Text me when you get there. Well, how come you didn't text me? All this kind of stuff. And it's, it's created a psychosis for the parents. You know, so anyway, yeah, that's, that's no, it's, it's hard. I agree. It's really, I always tell people even, I don't, how old are your kids, Andy? I have a kid that just started college and just started real life. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so they're older. 18, so you, so yours also, see, we, um, I have, my youngest is 15 right now. And then I have a 17 year old. And then my three oldest are now 24, 22 and almost 20. And the thing was, is that for the three older ones, um, they grew up like when I took them to the park when they were little, I didn't have a phone. I think I had a phone maybe that was in my car. I can't remember exactly, but it was not, there was no text. I don't know. We weren't texting or anything like that. I think we had car phones, something. But so the smartphone has really changed for parents. And I think that it's really only been since like 2007, eight when they became ubiquitous. And so kids who were born in like the early 2000s have had a lot different experience than our kids who were born in the 19 like 90s mid 1990s so i talk to parents a lot about how i think it's harder their job now is harder navigating these screens um i've had a much harder time with my two boys who are 15 and 17 than anything with my girls because the stuff wasn't there i didn't have to worry about my young girls being on instagram because it hadn't been invented yet so I feel very fortunate, but now we have to figure out how to deal with it. And I agree that just getting them off their phones however we can and getting them outside is one way that we're going to help our kids a lot. What I tell my camp parents is that technology, technology is a drug and that we are the drug pushers and that it's up to us to treat it the same way. So yes, we're from a little bit of a different generation. We are lucky. Okay. But yet we monitored how much time our kids watch TV, right? Yep. So we should be doing the same thing with technology. It's the same exact thing. And, and yeah. parents are, some parents are totally into that and totally get it. Uh, and, you know, remember, I'm getting kids, maybe it's the same at your camp, but I'm getting kids, this is their first time away from their parents. I'm getting young kids going off to day camp, right? And the parents have so much more anxiety than the kids have. Because for them to be disconnected from their kids is just like removing an appendage of their body, right? So, um, they know that, that that camp is super important, not just for the kids, but for them. So um, my view of camp is that it, it is an environment for kids to be gaining these skills that they don't normally get, right? So we're talking about how to, how to work together as a team and how to communicate with one another and, and just the independence of being away from home. <laughs> how to make friends and how to keep friends. You know, that's not like an innate skill. If you don't practice it, you don't know how to do it. Um, and in, the, in this world that we are in now, this, this modern world, we're in a world where friendships turn into play dates. But we're going to have a play date as opposed to that natural thing where we just went outside and whoever was there was there, right? Which is funny. I, I used to say, you know, people used to say, oh, how did we get to this point? And I used to joke around and say, oh, it was when the kids went on the side of the milk cartons, right? But I had a camp parent the other day, I thought it was very funny, who said, no, 
it's central air. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And he said, because as soon as it started hermetically sealing these houses, you know, you know, it used to be that the, when I was a kid, my friends would walk past the house at eight in the morning, you know, and be like, hey, Andy, can you come out and play? And all the windows were open because, you know, we didn't have air conditioning, right? But now, like, they're hermetically sealed, right? I had a neighbor that um, for about eight months, we, could, we didn't meet them when they moved in because they had the electric garage door opener, and they went right in, and then, boom, nothing. You couldn't make a noise, nothing, and then hear, see, nothing, right? So anyway. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, I never thought about it, but that is really true, like being, well, it kind of leads to that whole thing, like the whole discomfort, like when you get too comfortable, things don't go well. It's a good, it's a good analogy. Like when we're getting so comfortable just in our houses with our air conditioning, you don't yeah. meet as many people, you don't sit on your front porch and drinking your lemonade and saying hi to the neighbors. I got 300 channels on my direct TV. I got central air. Yeah. I Why go anywhere? <laughs> what, what the heck? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's Let really interesting. Let me see how they're doing on Facebook. There you go. There, I just checked in with my friends. Right. Okay, so I really want to know, you mentioned that you have met Lenore Skenazy. How do you pronounce her name, actually? Skenazy. Skenazy. Okay, I have been following her since way back when that she wrote that first article and that led to the book and then I read the book. So tell me about your interactions with her, how you've met her and, and that. Yeah, well, we got her to speak at, our, at the Tri-State Camp Conference, which I've been in charge of for many years. And, um, and it was really funny. She told a great story. Um, well, first I introducing her, I told the story that I'll tell you really quick about how when I, cause my, both of my parents grew up in New York city. Right. And when you grow up in the city, you know, you're, you're almost like those little Chinese kids. They talk about the Japanese kids that take the school, that they take the when bus. They're to four. School. Yeah. Yeah. But when, you know, our parents generation that grew up in cities, that's sort of how they grew up in many ways. So when I was old enough growing up in the New Jersey suburbs, um, I wanted to go see the Mets, which was my favorite team, and my dad couldn't do it. He was busy, uh, and he said, you know what? I think you're old enough now. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're going into sixth grade, and this is what we're going to do. You're going to uh, buy the round-trip ticket at the five and dime, and then you're going to get on the bus, and then you're going to get to the Port Authority. Then you're going to look for the Purple 7, which is the train that takes you right in front of the stadium, and then you're going to go get a general admission ticket, okay? And then you're going to go in, and then you're going to go up to the, to the front row seats, and you're going to give them the general admission ticket, and you're going to slip a $10 bill right behind it and the guy's gonna let you right in because i've did it my whole life trust me it'll work and i'm like 10 years old going okay dad okay dad right and i got all the way up there did everything you told me to do i slipped the guy the ticket with it with the ten dollars and he starts screaming at me what the heck are you doing right and i get all embarrassed and i start running away and as i'm running away he whistles to me because he must have seen that it wasn't a setup and he, he says come back here kid takes the ten dollars puts me in a seat <laughs> and sets me up Right. And, and my point in, 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 in when I was introducing Lenore, I was saying, can you imagine anyone doing that with their kids nowadays? Like, could you imagine doing that? And, and it was funny because right around then, my daughter, who was about 13 or 14, had friends. She went to sleepaway camp and had friends that lived in New York City and she wanted to go meet them. And for years, I was trying to convince my wife to let her go do it, you know, because of my crazy, you know, as my, my wife says, my free range upbringing that I've had. Um, and she would never let me. Just, so finally, I convinced her. I said, let me go with her. And I'll let her do everything, and then I'll just sort of watch. So she said, okay, I'll let you do that. So we get to the train station, and we're, we're waiting online for tickets, okay? And I'm sort of standing in the back. I was like, get two round-trip tickets. She goes up to, to the ticket window, and there's a line of people behind her. She takes her pocketbook off her shoulder, and she places it behind her and starts talking to the ticket person. And I was like, okay, game's over. I failed as a parent, you know? So anyway... I told that story, everybody laughed. Lenore gets up there and starts talking and she, um, she starts telling the story about wh one of the reasons why people are crazed about their kids and why such a hubbub got, uh, and for, for your listeners that don't realize, like she made a name for herself because her child wanted to ride the subway by themselves. Like the kid advocated and she put her kids in the subway at a subway station. And this is a woman that lives in, in New York City. And then she drove like seven stops ahead and waited for them to get out. And these kids felt such a great sense of accomplishment and it was such a great thing and she wrote a blog about it. And then the Today Show put her on and put the, the subtext, worst mom in America. <laughs> and that's like where she got her notoriety from. Um, but she said, um, you know, people are worried that someone is gonna snatch their kid. Like that's this crazy pathos that people have, right? And if you look at the statistics, like in America, where there's, you know, 100 million kids, like 35 kids get snatched a year, right? And most of them is from your crazy uncle. 
or something like that, right? He says, in that same calendar year, over a hundred kids get run over and killed in their own driveway by their parents. Mm. There's three times the chance of you running over your child in your own driveway than someone snatching your kid. And just how it's just, it's just, yeah, it's, I, yeah. for me, right now, if something happened to a child in Iowa, I would get a push notification on my phone. Right. That would spark whatever that negative juice in my body that starts going through my veins and get me all crazy. Yeah. Right. And for, for moms who love their kids that, that keep seeing this, it's only making them crazy and crazy. So, so, so camp is a, it's a respite for these parents. Uh-huh. It's forced detachment yeah. for them yeah. to be able to, you know, and for them to know, you know, because everyone, knows a good camp is about as safe as you could ever have. Mm-hmm. Camp, right. Mm-hmm. Um, insurance companies love my camp because mm-hmm. I never file any claims. Right, right. Make tons of money and I don't file any claims. Yeah. My, staff, my staff gets hurt. Kids generally don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so, yeah, so it's a big thing for them, for, for, that, for, for them to be able to drop their kids off. And I see it all the time in, my, um, in, these, in these surveys that I send to the, to the parents at the end of the season. One of the questions is, you know, why do you, why do you send your kids? What do you love about Liberty Lake? It's a great question, camp directors. What do you love about? the name of your camp, right? And, and so many of them say, because I know that my kid is having a great time and I know they're safe and I don't have to worry and I can just go about my business, yeah. you know, and live my life, right? And it just yeah. makes them settle. So it, it, at camp, you know, I, I did a session last year at the Tri-State Camp Conference, which I'll, I'm gonna potentially do it at National. I've, I missed the cutoff and I'm talking to the people there about how to integrate free play into your day camp. Now at sleepaway camp, it's simple, right? Because you're there for 24 hours and you've got rest hour and shower hour and hangout hour. Like you got all this built in free play time. And frankly, I went to sleepaway camp for two years. And if you said, what do you remember from sleepaway camp? It's that informal time with the kids in my bunk. That's what I remember now, 40 years later, right? 35 years later. But at, at day camp, camp directors are so obsessed with pleasing the parents and making sure that the kids are doing something every month. So we complain that these parents overprogram these kids. And then we create day camps with these militaristic grids where they're going this, they're getting changed, they're running from this, they're going to that, and half hour this, half hour that, right? And the kid goes home, is like, oh my gosh, totally exhausted, right? So I, I put, oh, and, and coupled with that, when I went to this partnership for 21st century learning skills in Washington, DC, they had a summit there and they, they have a lot of the Disney people talking. They have a center for creativity, right? And um, what I learned is that creativity is not writing a song and painting a picture. And I'm a songwriter, I'm a musician. So that's how I think creative, creativity, right? Writing the color war themes, right? Um, no, creativity is figuring out what to do when you have a situation. That's actually real creativity. And creativity like that is not learned in structured play with grown-ups telling you what to do, right? And I, and I tell, sometimes I, I talk to new parents and I, I explain to them that we do a lot of play here, a lot of free play. And, and they say, oh, my, my, my son knows how to play. Are you kidding me? Right now in the fall, he's playing fall baseball. He's playing football. He does evening soccer. I'm like, first of all, He's not playing. He's doing what grown-ups are telling him what to do. He's spending half of his life in cars with you driving him to these places, right? I mean, how often does your kid just go outside and play? Because when I, when I told my kids, my kids who have been to camp their entire lives since they were babies, and I say, go outside and play, they tended to look at me like I had like three eyeballs on my head and be like, what does that even mean, just go out and play? Like, don't we have to play something? Isn't somebody going to play with us and tell us what to do, right? So, so when we integrated free play as an actual 45 minute period into our day camp, across the board for all different, from, from preschoolers to middle schoolers, okay? Every single division and every division's two grades has a 45 minute period of free play every single day. When we put it in, it was, it was comical that I had to explain what free play is. And not so much for the kids, but the counselors who are just older versions of these kids that grew up in this generation, same, same concept. I don't understand any, what do we do? You know, in their defense, I always tell them what to do, right? Now I'm saying line up in a, get up, spread out in a zone defense. Okay. Choose an area. And when the kids come around you, you can play with them, but don't run anything. Let them run it. And if there's an argument, dispute, let them solve it. If it comes to fisticuffs, if they're cursing at each other, yes, jump in, of course. But 
free play. Let it organically happen. And for the first couple of weeks, they were so awkward and, and bizarre about it. And then finally, they sort of got it. And now, of course, it's one of their favorite things to do in the entire I'm world. Sure, right? I'm sure. So I introduced this concept at this camp conference. I'm talking to this room of 250 day camp people, okay? And they're looking at me like I'm nuts. Like I'm nuts. And this woman raises her hand from a prominent camp, a prominent camp, and says, I don't understand. Like, how do they not just start killing each other? <laughs> I said, well, you have baseball at your camp, right? She said, yeah. I said, do they, do they hit each other over the heads at baseball with the baseball bats? No. Why? Well, because, you know, there's counselors. There. Well, they probably don't hit themselves over the head with baseball bats besides the fact because there's counselors there right? They also probably because you have a culture in your camp that people just don't do that, right? Um, l let me interject with um, one of the most magical things I've ever seen in a camp. I visited Banner Day Camp in, uh, outside Chicago in Lake Forest, Illinois, about 20 years ago, because they start about three or four weeks before we start, right? The beginning of June. And, when, and they had over a thousand kids at their camp on a, on a given day back then. And so they had these hundred buses show up, right? And as the buses were showing up, the kids would just, they would put their, their, their backpacks down at this amphitheater area, and then they would just play until all the buses were here, right? So for that, for a good 20 minutes, all throughout the camp, there's hopscotch, and there's jump rope, and they're shooting baskets. Now, they're not doing archery or gymnastics, okay? But they're playing, right? And they're hanging out, and it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. It was like a Norman Rockwell painting of how kids should be, mm -hmm. right? And where were the counselors? Well, they're, they're scattered all over the place because they're coming in on the buses at the same time too. And trust me, I was having heart palpitations because I wasn't used to seeing this kind of situation with like minimal staff. But the kids were just, had great decorum and it was the most wonderful thing. And then all of a sudden, once all the buses were here, they started playing like Wagner, like, da, 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 da. and then all the kids just like, whoa, and they all ran to the amphitheater and sat down in their seats. But for that 20 minutes, I was like, holy mackerel, I want to do that. That's what I want to do in my camp. How do I make that happen? And you have to be very intentional about it. You have to intentionally put in free play into your thing. And, and for day camps to have any issues with it because of supervision or something, it is totally unfounded. And, and not only that, my day camp friends who are listening, it's the cheapest activity you'll ever run in your entire life because it's free play. They're playing on playgrounds. They're in sandboxes. Like they're, they're, you know, they're playing tetherball, gaga, foursquare, things like that. They want to do that. Kids want to play on, in that playground kind of vibe. Um, it's a natural thing to do. And they love those playground games, by the way, because they're not so finite right? Basketball has one set of rules. This is how you play basketball, okay? But wall ball and, and four square and gaga, you can make it 29 different versions of it and, and, and have the kids put their creativity into it. And, and those kind of games also create conflict. They just do. Uh, hey, um, you got hit by that ball. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Wait, no, I didn't. Wait, hold on. Hey, didn't he get hit by that ball and all that kind of stuff? And then they have to figure that out. And for a camp like mine, where one of our start points is integrity, like we preach, like how you get out of those situations and how do you come to the, to the realization that you might be wrong with that. And you got to take other people's words for it and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm here to tell you it can be done and it can be very successful and that kids really, really enjoy it. And it is the natural state of children. Yeah, <laughs> and, absolutely. And what about, um, what about for parents, like in their neighborhoods, like what would you suggest for parents who are wanting to bring some free play back? Why, why couldn't they do the same thing if you had another family over or something, just kind of yeah. send the kids out and say, play. No. And, 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 you know, so many parents tell me the same thing. They tell me just like, if you re, if you follow Lenore Skenazy's uh, play blog, whatever the heck it's called, um, let's play, I think it's called. Um, they talk about these other parents who don't believe the same thing as you believe, who are like militant about like calling the police and reprimanding you and making you a social pariah because you let your kids just go out and play. And I hear this all the time of families who, whose kid would have to walk seven blocks to get to the playground. You know, and the cool mom who's like, well, that's fine. He can handle that. You know, he's eight years, nine years old. He can do that kind of thing. And then all the moms in the neighborhoods who are the helicopter parents who think it's child abuse for you to do that. And I think that there's this weird thing right now in society hmm. about, you know, 
<laughs> but what if you just find, see, to me, I feel like if you could just find a few like-minded families, you know, in your neighborhood, at your school, who will, you know, you guys come up with guidelines and say, hey, I'm fine with our kids, like, going to this park or doing this thing or just playing on their own out in the backyard or whatever it is. I feel like there are enough people who would really want that for their kids. I mean, when you think about now, like you were, we were talking before we recorded how people love camp so much because they want so much for their kids to have that just experience of being with friends and being outdoors and just playing a lot. And so I feel like parents could figure out ways to recreate that at home, even if it's just your backyard or I don't even know the backyard, even the street yeah. of a quiet street. Yeah. Hey, yeah. we said it before. Audrey, right? I feel that the new generation of parents, and when I say the new generation of parents, I'm saying like between 30 and 40 years old, that they, they do get it. And I do feel the pendulum is flipping, right? And certainly any parent that has the courage to send their kids off to camp, mm-hmm. they, they're already, then you're preaching to the choir. It's the other people we're talking about. <laughs> I do feel that there's enough people now that are reading these mommy blogs, that are reading all these things out there and understand that we've messed up a generation of kids. And that, you know, that whole participation trophy and all that kind of thing. No, we don't want that anymore. You know, we want our kids to skin their knee, right? We want our kids to experience hardships and all that kind of thing, right? Whereas 20, 25 years ago, it was, no, 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 my, my child needs to sit in the air conditioning and, and not have any tough situations. We want to shelter them from that, right? And then what happened? They graduated college, they didn't get their first job, and then now they've been on Prozac living at home, right? So, now- oh my gosh, what a summary. <laughs> Now, we don't want our kids to be that, right? We want them out of the house at 22, 23, cut off, financially, you know, capable of of dealing with themselves. So, yes, I do think there's enough like-minded people out there, and people need to talk about it, and it needs to be a thing, right? It can't be a secret. No. Right? They've got to go public with this, right? And what if you follow Lenore Skenazy's stuff, um, there are more and more schools that are integrating free play Mm -hmm. into what they do. Right. There's um, we had a guy, he didn't come out last year to try state because of the snow, but who's that, that guy in California, he's like this, you know, retired billionaire who set up a whole free play thing in his house. Oh, yeah, I've, I've seen, I've seen pictures of that. It's like in Menlo park or something in right. Northern California. Yes. I, yes. I have seen pictures and he lets kids like tire swings and axes. I don't even know, but like anyone can come play in his yard. Right, the whole right? comes over. Yeah. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, trampoline is the whole deal. So, so yeah. So I I think that the new wave of parents is going to start pushing out that old wave of thinking. Right. Because people are going to realize that taking safe risks is really important. Right. Have you seen those, um, have you seen those parks? I I reviewed a book that was about, I can't remember the name of it, but so I think it's in Japan. They have these parks where they have like pieces of wood, hammers and nails, fires, and young kids, parents are like, you know, they're sitting, sitting far away, like in a bench, but kids are climbing across bridges and hammering things and lighting fires. And it's so great. And it's funny. I once heard someone say, oh, well, you know, like we can't even do campfires anymore because they're not safe. And I'm thinking we do campfires every single night at camp and kids do not step in the fire. They respect it. They learn how to light it. They, we make sure there's an adult there, but it's just amazing how we undersell what kids are capable of. Very young kids. I remember with my own kids, I remember thinking around age four, they knew to look both ways. Like they could, like I could let them, I could say to them, okay, I'm going to put you in charge of crossing the street. I'm with you, but I'm going to let you look. And they can actually at that age already discern, okay, it's safe to cross or something like that. So I think we need to let kids do more like what we used to allow kids to do way back when going back to the, you know, go back to like our childhood where we were just trusted. We were treated as more responsible. And you were telling the story about your, your big trip to the baseball game. I was thinking I had a a newspaper route at age 10 with my bike and they would, um, it was an afternoon paper on Monday through Friday and then morning on Saturday and Sunday. And they would, they would deliver to my driveway, the flat papers. I would wrap them, put them in the, the rubber bands, put them in my bike holder thing. I like a banana seat bike. And I had this little route. It was like a mile and I would, you know, throw the papers and I had to collect the subscription fees too. Like go door to door, like once every quarter to, I mean, it was just crazy. And then I had to set up my own checking account. I mean, like that just reminded me of that. I'm like, okay, I was 10. It was, you know, and that's what I was doing. And boy, did I feel so 
cool. Like I had a job, I was making money. Um, it was so amazing. And just thinking about those kind of opportunities, when you do those things, you feel so great and it builds up your confidence. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I can do this without my mom and dad. It's really, really good for kids to get any opportunity we can give them to get that feeling. I had a paper route too. Same age, all that. Got bit by dogs. It was great. But um, <laughs> the, um, the, the thing that I talk about when I go down this path with parents is we're preparing kids for life right? We're preparing them for adulthood. We're preparing them for college. We're preparing them for career. We're preparing them for life. And um, the college thing rings very relevant to a lot of parents who don't send their kids to camp, right? Because look, if you're sending your kids to sleepaway camp, they're learning this kind of stuff there. It may only be two weeks, but they're really getting it, right? And, but when parents who never went to camp, they don't understand what I'm talking about. I say, well, think about your freshman year in college when you went there and you didn't know anybody. And you had to survive and you had to get yourself up in the morning and wake up. Although I, I hear that nowadays, the typical college kid talks to their parents or texts their parents on a daily basis. But anyway, um, my point is that right now, the statistic is that only 55% of kids going off to four-year colleges actually graduate within six years. Only 55%. Okay. Why is this? Now, Yes, college is crazy expensive. So I'm sure there's financial reasons for that. But a main reason there is because the kids can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's because these kids have been so protected and so nurtured and not been given paper routes when they were 10 years old, okay? And not been allowed to do things and not been allowed to go into the park and all that kind of stuff. And now they're going off to college and now they gotta do all these little things on their own. And so many of them don't even get through their freshman year. Right. And, and I've seen now I've had two kids be, be freshmen and I see some of these cor courses in college now. Their colleges are being smart because they want to keep them around. And they're doing these really introductory kind of freshman -y things now to get kids because they know they're not coming in with a background of independence. Mm -hmm. So they know they have to they have to nurture them and mentor them to get them through that first year. But I do think I think you're right. And I know that, you know, ACA is doing this big study now, but I know what they're going to find because we know this anecdotally and from our own kind of in camp research that kids who have had that experience of going to camp are have better skills at problem solving, doing things without their parents. And I really do think for us, because they don't have their phones and they can't call their parents, they learn to rely on their friends, rely on other trusted adults, which is a really important thing. And I know you probably read How to Raise an Adult by, um, oh, why am I blanking? Julie Lithcott Hames. And she talks about how when she was at Stanford as a dean of freshmen, how many kids, you know, she'd be asking them about their courses and they'd be like, wait, I need to call my mom. Can you talk to my mom? And she was like, wait, you're, this is your school and, and I'm someone who knows about courses and it's your life and everything else. But she was pretty shocked that that's what was kind of going on. And I, I think it's really good anytime we can give our kids opportunities, even if they are at home, to just say to them, hey, is there someone else you can talk to at school about that? Rather than, you know, as the parent just jumping in and trying to solve their problems. Because as we know, it doesn't turn out well for them when we're, we're, catching them all the time. Yeah. And, and we know as camp directors that we see it in our staff. You know, mm -hmm. It's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good that you think the tide is turning. I think I'm seeing that too. Although I, I agree with you, the parents that send their kids to camp are pretty amazing. So I think they're more cutting edge um, for us. You know, we're a resident camp and they come for two weeks, but we have kids who come for five weeks and seven weeks and all kinds of long times. And parents and kids have no problem without having phones. They all know that, you know, if the kid's sick, we're going to call. If anything's going on, we're going to call. It's just this trust thing. And I think you're right. It's a relief for parents to not have to be tracking their kids or waiting for a text when they get somewhere. It's just they know they're safe. They're having fun. They're outdoors. They, they have to get over that hump. Yeah. Right? We went technology. As soon as people started walking around with phones, we went technology free at our Yeah, camp. great. Very, Militant about it, like we kick kids out of camp, we kick, we fire staff. We don't, not too many, because it never really gets to that point, because um, we've created a culture. But yeah, um, we know that that first transition in is going to be weird, right? right. Those first few days are going to be almost like withdrawal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, we've had such a great long chat here. Where can people find? I know you've written some articles. Um, can is it just at the Liberty Lake Day Camp site, or where can people find you and your work that you're doing around youth awesome. development? 
I mean, certainly my, um, my website at camp is libertylakedaycamp.com. That's my main camp. And, um, you know, for my articles, many of them are on ACA, American Camp Association websites. Um, m many of them are in parent magazines and parent blogs and things like that. So I think if you just Google Andy Pritikin, P-R-I-T-I-K-I-N, you'll find many articles out there. Okay, great. I will definitely share this in the um, show notes too, so that people can find you. But it's been great chatting with you today, Andy. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Audrey. I really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you so much for joining Andy and me for this episode of the podcast. For notes and links about everything that we talked about, please visit my website at sunshine-parenting.com and search for episode 60. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with your fellow parents. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to leave you with a quote from one of my favorite mentors, Fred Rogers. Play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood.